Today we have with us uh, Dr. John Lott. Uh, Dr. Lott is an economist and a world-recognized expert on guns and crime and is the president of the Crime Prevention Research Center. He's held research and teaching or teaching positions at various academic institutions, including the University of Chicago, Yale University, the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, Stanford University, and Rice University, and was the chief economist at the United States Sentencing Commission during 1988 to 1989. Nobel laureate Milton Friedman noted, quote, John Lott has few equals as a perceptive analyst of controversial public policy issues, unquote. Dr. Lott has published over 100 articles in peer-reviewed academic journals and, is, and has written nine books, including More Guns, Less Crime, The Bias Against Guns, Freedom Econ Freedomomics, Freedomomics, I had a hard time with that earlier today. Tongue tire there for me. His most recent book, is the war on guns, and he holds a PhD in economics from UCLA. Um, Dr. Lott, if you could uh, take the microphone there, sir, and we're ready for your presentation when you're ready to begin, sir, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, thank you all very much. I greatly appreciate Representative Metcalf for inviting me to talk here. Uh, I was asked to talk about the general issue of gun-free zones. I thought I would mainly concentrate on uh, uh, tax in uh, schools, K through 12. Pass the gift man to your job. Pass the gift man to your job. Pass the gift man to your job. Pass the man to your Pass the gift man to your job. Dr. Lott, um, if you can I think that's another suspend, hearing that you have, right? We'll just suspend your presentation for a moment while security removes the protesters. Pass the gift man to your job. Pass the gift man to your job. Pass the gift man to your job. Pass the gift man So just take a couple minutes. I did not ask them to come today. I couldn't have got them to come if I would have asked them, most likely. So, to provide a little excitement for the uh, for the audience today, um, kind of add adds to the whole capital atmosphere and uh, our constitutional republic in Pennsylvania and America. Now, the minority chairman is just coming in. I don't think he invited him either today. Would that be correct, Representative Bradford, Chairman Bradford? You didn't invite those folks today. I said I didn't invite them. I couldn't have got them here if I would have invited them, but they just kind of came and kind of add a little extra to the atmosphere. So, it's Bill, of Rights Day. Bill of Rights Day. Thank you for joining us, sir. Our minority chair, uh, Representative Bradford. Um, so, Dr. Lott, you were just beginning. If you wouldn't mind taking it from the top, sir, we'd appreciate it. Sure, I appreciate it. And again, I appreciate Representative Metcalf for inviting me to talk. I was asked to talk about the issue of gun-free zones, and uh, um, and I'm mainly going to be focusing on uh, gun-free zones in educational institutions, but it broadly applies to anything that we could talk about with regard under that topic. If we could get you to just pull the microphone a little closer sure. so our listening audience and we'll pick sure. up. Thank I, you, sir. I apologize. Uh, I'm going to make three general points. One is just what are the behavior of concealed carry permit holders. Uh, the second one is specific concerns about the risks of permit holders carrying. I'm sorry, you can't hear me? Okay. I think I'm speaking into it, but the uh, is this not working? No, it's it's, it's working. I mean, it's protesting, making it a little harder. Maybe if you want to move over to this side behind me, maybe you'll be able to hear a little better from this side of the room. I'm not sure, but on the right side, we can hear them. If you'd like to move over, you're more than welcome to. You can come to my right side. I, I think it's not just metaphorically. Turn the volume up. Okay. I think I'll, I'll try to speak louder. I apologize. If you, you turn the volume up in the, on the back. Not your fault, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. So... Um, so I'm going to talk about the behavior of permit holders. I'm going to talk about the specific risks involved with permit holders carrying guns at schools or universities. And then I'm going to talk about the benefits of, uh, of people being able to carry. You know, with regard to uh, the behavior of permit holders, one thing that's clear is that is permit holders are incredibly law-abiding. In fact, I would argue it's pretty hard to think of almost any other group in the population that's as law-abiding as permit holders are. Right now, we have... As of the beginning of this year, we had something over 15.5 million concealed carry permit holders in the United States. And that's actually an underestimate of the number of people who carry because there are 14 states now that allow people to carry with that, without having a permit. 
Uh, there are a couple things just to point out here. One is if you look at revocations of permits for any reason, uh, for firearms-related uh, reasons, you're talking about, for any reason, you're talking about tenths or hundreds of 1%. If you're talking about revocations for firearms-related violations, you're talking at rates of thousands or tens of thousands of 1%. One useful comparison might be comparing the rate that police officers are convicted of either misdemeanors or... You might compare the rates that police officers are convicted of misdemeanors or felonies uh, compared to uh, uh, permit holders. And I uh, just have a comparison here for Texas, which has fairly detailed information that's, that's public. Uh, there's a study done in Police Quarterly uh, that came out in 2010 that uh, looked at the rate of uh, convictions for police and misdemeanors and felonies and also allowed it to break it down by firearms-related violations. What you find is that uh, uh, police for misdemeanors or felonies are convicted at about one-tenth of one percent. Uh, and that's, that's probably a, a little bit of an underestimate because they're relying on news stories to put this together. But even so, that's a rate that's about 131st the rate for the general population. So police officers are convicted of misdemeanors or felonies at a tiny rate compared to the general population. But if you, if you compare uh, permit holders compared to police officers, they're actually convicted at one-tenth the rate that police officers are. So that's, that's one three-hundredth the rate of the general population. Uh, if you look at firearms-related violations, uh, police officers are convicted of firearms-related violations at about two hundredths of one percentage point. If you look at, uh, for the general population, it's about two thousandths of one percentage point. So again, uh, it's about uh, police officers are much less likely than general population. I think just for clarification for some of us who couldn't hear the front part, when you're saying permit holders, you're saying concealed carry Correct. permit holders? Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry to interrupt. I just was trying to... No, I apologize for the noise. It's... Uh, so anyway, but that's... So permit holders are convicted about one-seventh the rate that police officers are for firearms-related violations. I could go through other states. Uh, Florida kept detailed records of firearms-related violations of permit holders between 1987 and May 2012. During that period of time, uh, they had issued permits to about 2.1 million people. The average person had their permit for about a little bit over 12 years on average. Uh, and over that whole period of time, with millions of people having permits with, on an average of over 12 years each, uh, you're talking about only 168 revoked for any type of firearms-related violation. And even that, the primary type of violation that people had was one of two types. One, accidentally carrying a permit-concealed handgun into a gun-free zone, uh, like a school or an airport, or um, uh, uh, accidentally car carrying their concealed handgun and forgetting to have their permit with them. I can go through other states. There's detailed information. Now. The question is, well, what about at universities or K through 12 schools? What's been the experience there? And we have a lot of extensive experience there. There are 12 states that mandate that permit holders uh, be allowed to carry guns on public university campuses if they have a permit. There's another 23 states that leave it up to the university. Uh, though in most of those 23 states, uh, relatively few schools uh, allow it. But you do have some large schools like Michigan State, for example, that, that do. Uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, you have uh, Kurtztown University, uh, Shippensboro, Edinburgh, Slippery Rock, and Millersville uh, that all allow concealed carry on campus, so they don't allow it in, uh, in school buildings. Um, now, uh, you know, if you look at the history there, it's not only do we have all these states now that allow this. But prior to the early 1990s, you really didn't have any states 
that uh, allowed concealed carry, that banned people being able to carry on college campuses. It's only when you started having the Federal Safe School Zone Act being passed that there was a general discussion and you would have uh, some changes being made in the laws at that time. Um, and there's no examples of problems even during that earlier period. So what about the specific concerns about uh, uh, students or young people who would be 21 or older carrying permanently concealed handguns? Obviously, there's concerns about drinking and irresponsible behavior. But I think the thing to rec understand is that there's one thing to look at young people in general, and the other thing is to look at those who go out of their way to go and get a permit to carry. Those people tend to be extremely law-abiding. I'll give you some numbers in a second. Just as one example of that, you cannot find one single example where a permit holder who has been allowed to carry on a university campus has committed a crime. Uh, there have been five accidental discharges, one in Colorado, one in Idaho, one in Mississippi, and two in Utah. None of those uh, have been life-threatening. In three states, it's possible to get revocation rates by permit holders broken down by year of age of the permit holder. That's from Michigan, Nevada, and Texas. And if you look at uh, school age people, uh, 21 to 22, versus people who are 23 and above, what you find, in fact, is that in two of those states, I mean, across all those states, just as I was talking about before, the revocation rate for permit holders is very low. But uh, for two of the three states, it's actually lower for those who are college age than it is for, uh, for the general uh, population of permit holders. And the other state, Nevada, where it's reversed, they're essentially the same. It's slightly higher for those who are college age. But in all cases, we're talking about very low numbers. You have a similar experience when you look at K through 12. There are 24 states that allow teachers and staff to carry, though the rules vary quite a bit across states. Alabama, Utah, New Hampshire, and parts of Oregon leave it up to the teachers and staff to just determine on their own to carry. Uh, in other states, essentially similar to the bill that was is in the Pennsylvania Senate right now, where it'd be up to uh, local school officials to be able to make some decisions in some cases it's the school board that makes the decision. In other cases, it could just be school principals or the superintendent who would make those decisions. Um, but, you know, you can look across. You have some places like Ohio next door to Pennsylvania where they have 40 school districts that allow teachers and staff to carry. Um, and as I say, you see similar experiences, common fear that someone will take a gun away from a teacher and it will be used improperly. Despite all this experience, uh, that there's, that's never happened. Uh, there's been not one single example where a permit holder who has been allowed to carry on uh, school grounds has committed a crime. And there's only been one accidental discharge in K-12, through and that was at a, 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 a school in Utah in 2014. Uh, there was no injury that occurred. So... Uh, other, there are two other broad concerns that exist. One is, uh, might if we have a mass public shooting, might you have a situation where a permit holder accidentally shoots a bystander when they're trying to stop this? And also, whether or not when the police arrive on the scene, might they confuse the permit holder for the person who's committing the attack and accidentally shoot the permit holder? You know, um, we have a lot of experience with this, too. Uh, there are dozens of cases where police, sheriffs, or prosecutors have said that um, multiple people would have died in different types of crimes if it hadn't been for the presence of a concealed care permit holder. And yet, despite all those examples, I cannot find one single case of a mass public shooting where the permit holder has accidentally shot a bystander. And I cannot find one single case where a permit holder has accidentally been shot by the police officer when they've arrived on the scene. So while these concerns are possible, you know, in a lot of the gun control debate, there are things that might possibly happen, obviously. If you actually look at the data, uh, you know, there'd be more of a debate if one could actually point to cases where those things, rather than hypothetically might happen, actually did occur. You know, if you look since 1950, 
All but four of the mass public shootings in, in the United States have taken place where general citizens aren't allowed to have had guns for protection. And I'm basically using the FBI traditional definition up until a couple of years ago where four or more people are killed in a public venue where uh, um, it wasn't part of some other crime like uh, a gang fight or uh, some robbery that was occurring, where the point was what I think concentrates the focus of most people's concerns about mass public shootings, where there's attack in order to try to kill people uh, to get attention. And that's why I think the FBI broke down its definition like that. You know, you look at Europe, for example, every single one of the mass public shootings that have occurred in Europe, even the ones in Switzerland, have occurred in places where general citizens aren't allowed to be able to go and have guns. And if these types of attacks were random, you know, in a place like Pennsylvania, you're able to go and carry your permanent concealed handgun virtually any place in the state. There's almost 1.3 million concealed carry permit holders in the state of Pennsylvania. There's only one other state that has uh, a larger absolute number of concealed carry permit holders, and that's Florida. Uh, but as a percentage of the population, there's uh, over 11 percent of the adult population in Pennsylvania has a concealed carry permit. There's some counties in the state where it's nearly 30 percent. But um, <clears throat> um, you would imagine if these venues that these killers chose to do the attacks were random, then then 98, 97 percent of the attacks would be taking place in areas where permanent concealed handguns are allowed. And that's true in other right to carry states. And yet when you look at this time after time, the attacks occur in those tiny areas within those states where permanent concealed handguns aren't allowed. And there are plenty of statements that have been made by these killers. You know, uh, just last year there was an attack that was uh, successfully averted in Detroit. A father was concerned about his son's involvement with ISIS, had gone and told the FBI. The FBI did a tape of the conversations that the individual had. It had this 20-year-old on tape explaining why he was planning to attack one of the largest churches in the Detroit area. And his explanation, very chilling, was he had checked the different churches. And this one church had banned anybody from having permanent concealed handguns on church property. And he explained to his compatriot that he was talking about how that made it easier for him to kill multiple people before anybody would be able to be on the scene to attack. But there are other well-known cases, the Charleston church shooting. His original target was going to be Charleston College, but he decided not to do it after he checked on security arrangements there. You have something like the Batman movie theater shooting. His original target was going to be an airport. Similar types of concerns about people possibly being able to stop him. There were seven movie theaters within a 20-minute drive of the Batman movie theater shooter's apartment that were showing the premiere of the Batman movie. Only one of those movie theaters posted signs banning permanent concealed handguns. It wasn't the movie theater closest to his home or the one that had the largest auditoriums, but it was the one he picked. You look at any of the mall shootings in Omaha, Nebraska, Kansas City, Salt Lake City, Oregon. In, or in Omaha, Nebraska, you had eight enclosed malls. Only one of those posted signs banning permanent concealed handguns. It was the one farthest from the killer's home. That's the one he went to. Same type of situation in all those other cities. Salt Lake City, you had two enclosed malls out of eight enclosed malls that, uh, that banned permanent concealed handguns. And at some point, beyond the public statements, it's kind of hard to ignore the systematic nature of these attacks. If they were random, they shouldn't be occurring with that type of consistency that's there. Um, uh, I can go on. I'm not sure what's going on here. I could just talk about cases in Pennsylvania where mass public shootings have been stopped. There's been a couple, uh, one uh, at a barber shop in 2015 in Philadelphia where uh, the police uh, uh, captain said if the permit, had, per permit holder had responded, he responded, and I guess he saved a lot of people in there. Or in, uh, in Darby, Pennsylvania in 2014 uh, at a hospital, there was a psychiatrist who had his permit concealed handgun in there. Uh, if you listen to the Associated Press quoting a police, uh, police chief, he said, I believe the doctor saved lives. Without that firearm, uh, the shooter could have, been, uh, could have gone out in the hallway and just walked up and down offices until he was out of ammunition. 
when the doctor stopped him, he still had 39 bullets uh, available in other clips that he had. Here's the issue that you have when you're dealing with mass public shootings, and that is the huge strategic advantages that these killers face by being able to choose the time and the place of the attack. Governor Wolf has uh, said that he'd like to go and have police officers uh, guarding uh, the schools there. Besides the cost, one of the issues that you have there is putting people in uniform to guard potential shoot targets of mass public shootings is kind of like putting people there with a neon sign above them saying, shoot me first. I can give you case after case that when you have police officers or uniformed guards, they are always the first person that's shot at. The benefit of having concealed carry is that the attackers don't know who they have to take out first. Police have an extremely dangerous job, and in the case of trying to stop mass public shootings, it's a virtually impossible, extremely risky job that they have to do. But allowing concealed carry permit holders in an area actually makes the police job safer, because if the killer attacks and reveals his position, if other people can go and carry in that place, he has to worry about other people around him being able to go and respond. I can go and give you surveys of police. Here's one example from uh, uh, Police One, which is the largest private organization of police in the country with 450,000 members. Uh, they have uh, 70,000 retired full-time law enforcement and 380,000 active just so you know, there's about 650,000 active police in the United States. When they asked them about getting rid of gun-free zones, 80% uh, of the police officers surveyed thought that they thought that it would reduce uh, casualties from mass public shootings. Another 6% said that they thought it could possibly even eliminate them. If you look at surveys of criminologists and economists, uh, the vast majority of economists think that gun-free zones actually serve to attract killers because they make relatively easier targets. Criminologists are much more divided on it. They're fairly evenly divided, slightly more criminologists support it or not. I'll just try to go through this quickly here. Um, let me just summarize by pointing to statements by Ron Noble, who for 15 years was uh, Secretary General for Interpol. It's kind of Europe's version of the FBI, but they've been all over the world in terms of law enforcement. When uh, Noble first became Secretary General, he thought his solution to mass public shootings was simply to ban guns from certain areas. But what he learned over time was that it was essentially impossible when you're talking about civilian targets to effectively ban guns from being able to get into areas. Whether you put uh, you know, uh, metal detectors in front of movie theaters or malls, he found that these attacks are planned six months or a year or two years in advance. And when you're talking about these individuals, they're going to find some way to be able to go and get weapons into these facilities. And what he said, the only thing that you accomplish by creating these gun-free zones is making it so that none of the victims are basically able to go and fight back. And so, uh, you know, here's somebody even in Europe uh, who goes and is questioning the type of approach that one would think would be pretty common in Europe, just the notion of going and banning guns. So that I guess just the general question, just to summarize, is let's say, God forbid, somebody was threatening you or your family. Would you feel safer putting up a sign in front of your home saying your home is a gun-free zone? I've debated lots of people over time. I've never run into somebody who, on the other side of the debate, who would say that they would feel safer putting up a sign like that. And the question is why? You know, do they really think putting up a sign that says this is a gun-free zone would deter some killer from entering the home in order to go and attack them? Or would it actually encourage them because they be, have less to worry about and think that the individuals there wouldn't be able to go and protect themselves? I greatly appreciate your time, and I'm sorry if it was difficult to hear me at the beginning of the talk there. Thank you, Dr. Lott. Certainly, uh, you were speaking loud enough, just the noise outside was uh, kind of drowning you out at times, which uh, most of our uh, speakers don't have to compete with that type of outside noise. So it's a little different dynamic today. So we appreciate your perseverance and uh, delivering your Thank you. presentation today. Um, Representative Ryan is the first uh, member with a question. 
Doctor, first of all, thanks. It's great to see an economist that's done an objective analysis of this, and I agree with you 100%. Uh, to the chairman, I would like to extend my apologies. I was late. I had to wait until three people who were engaged in civil disobedience were arrested in the hallway. And that's actually somewhat what I want to speak on today, if you don't mind. Uh, since uh, December 18th, 1969 through May 1st, 2011, I spent the time in the United States Marine Corps. And like myself and Matt Gabler and others who have served in the military, Rick Saccone, we voluntarily surrendered our rights under the United States Constitution so we could defend yours. We gave up the right of freedom of assembly, although I was told I had a freedom of assembly. I could meet at 0500 all mo every morning for morning formation. I gave up my freedom of speech so I could say yes, sir, no, sir, so you can engage in your freedom of speech. I gave up my right to seek redress from the U.S. government, by giving, which is something that you all enjoy. Every veteran gave up their opportunity to seek redress. When we had the opportunity to say to our commanding officer, we're not happy with something, they could reassign us to a different base, typically somewhere in Alaska. And our freedom of religion is when that first round goes down range and is near you, you have the opportunity to say, thank God that didn't hit me. I am absolutely offended at that theatric show that was put out in the hallway when people prevented me from getting to my appointed place of duty at the appropriate point in time when I was supposed to be here by noon for a presentation called by our chair. That was done entirely for theatric purposes. The police officers who were out there did an unbelievably tremendous job at showing restraint. When on my office this morning, there was a sign advising my staff that people were going to come here today to specifically engage in acts of civil disobedience. Well, I spent 41 years of my life defending other people's freedom, and I'll be damned if anybody's going to take mine. Your comments, your book, God bless you for what you've done. I agree with you a thousand percent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Ryan. Representative Bradford. Thank you, sir. And I appreciate uh, this is an issue that I can't say I've spent a ton of time thinking it through the lens that uh, you've proposed. But in light of what Mr. Ryan said and, and the incident of this, uh, this afternoon, I can't help but think, just playing this out, um, if the individuals who engaged in civil disobedience just a few minutes ago had also been armed, do you think we'd be safer? that those police officers had to remove folks who were also armed? Well, I guess the issue would just be we have a lot of experience. We have states that have had these right to carry laws for 70, 80 years. Uh, we have all the states in the United States that allow concealed carry. Uh, 42 have rules similar to Pennsylvania, so-called objective permitting rules, and other state, eight states, which are more restrictive. But as I mentioned to begin with, Right now, we have over 15.5 million Americans that have concealed carry permits. Uh, we have another 14 states that don't require that you have to have permits in order to carry. And so we don't have to guess about the types of concerns that you're raising and just to see, you know, what's been the experience. How law-abiding are these individuals? And as I say, you know, you can compare them to the general population. You can compare them to police officers, for example. And as I was pointing out, you can see that concealed carry permit holders are convicted of misdemeanors or felonies at about one-tenth the rate that the police officers are, and police are convicted at about one-thirty-first the rate that the general population is. And you see a similar gap when you're talking about firearms-related violations, which is what you would be talking about. When you look across states, you see concealed carry permit holders losing their permits for any type of firearms-related violation, even including relatively trivial ones, like forgetting to have their permit with them with their carrying or, uh, you know, going accidentally going into a gun-free zone like an airport, at thousands or tens of thousands of one percentage point. So I understand your concern, and these things, you know, in theory might happen, but I think the best way to actually look at it is to see what has been the practical actual rate that problems have occurred. And, and again, I, I, uh, I'm not going to question the empirical data that you present, though there are those who obviously are very... Not on this point. Not, not on this one, but let me tell you, uh, I'm going to question the 
practical reality of there were three gentlemen, I believe, were the, the officers who made the decision they needed to be removed, and I'm not here to second guess that. But not in theory, in practice. Three gentlemen in the back of the room. Well, not, right. uh, and again, I'm not asking you to be a law enforcement officer. I'm just saying, do you think we're safe or you're safer? This obviously is a, dr- a gun-free building. Uh, there's checks to make sure no one is carrying a weapon. Are we safer if those officers have to pull out three armed individuals as opposed to unarmed individuals? I mean, I, I appreciate there is empirical data that you're pointing to, and, and and I'm glad to break that down as well. But there's practical realities. Are we really better off with, you know, Penn State frat brothers who weren't able to handle a frat party to also have weapons? I mean, I mean, let's not just talk uh, the empirical data, but let's apply it to real life. Well, I mean, Representative, Representative Bradford, I mean, I know you don't want to talk the facts, so well, to set the empirical data aside, but the reality is yeah, if, let's, those, let's if those... Let's not go down like, that road. Representative Bradford, right. if, if those three individuals could, would have been armed, that would have meant that the majority of this committee would have been armed, so I highly doubt that they would have been exercising civil disobedience that would have put our, jeopardy, our safety in jeopardy. No, right. And, Chairman, I, I appreciate it. I'm not going to get into who's got a monopoly on facts. I don't think that serves anyone. But he purposes. just presented the facts. So I'll give it back to Dr. Lott to go ahead and answer your question. Mr. Chairman, no, I, Chairman. Appreciate, I appreciate your question, and I understand the concern that you have with that. I guess, so I'm no problem answering. You know, again, I don't know how else to answer it other than to go and see how we actually see people behave. And the only way I can do that. And this is publicly available data. You can go to Texas or Florida or Michigan. You know, they have websites where they release very detailed data on the number of concealed carry permit holders in their state, as well as revocations and the reason for revocations by type of crime that they're either arrested or convicted for. And um, uh, what you find is that the permit holders in those places are you know, you're talking about re- revocations for firearms-related violations at thousands or tens of thousands of one percentage point. And so, you know, I, I, you know, so much of the gun debate is about what things might possibly go wrong. I'll give you one simple example, and that is uh, after 9-11, uh, I had several airline pilots unions come to me and ask me if I could help them let pilots be able to carry guns on planes. And one of the things... I had never realized before I started doing that is from 1924 to 1963, all commercial airline pilots in the United States were mandated to have guns with them on planes. They were allowed to do so up until 79. You literally had hundreds of millions of flights there that you could look at. And there was not one example of a problem that had occurred. But yet when you'd go around talking to senators, you know, going to Senator Feinstein's office or other ones that were there, they get into discussions about, well, what happens if two pilots get into an argument and they shoot each other in the cockpit or something like that? Is it possible that something like that could happen? Sure, it's possible. Maybe they bet money on the football game and got upset with each other or got into an argument over politics. But the question is, we have hundreds of millions of flights we can look at. Is there one case that's anything even remotely similar? So you have to look at the facts in those cases in order to get an idea of how much weight we should put on these types of things rather than saying something might possibly happen. So colleges, as I went through, we have uh, 12 states now that mandate that public universities have to allow uh, permit holders who are at least 21 to be able to go and carry on campus. And what are the problems? And so I went through, I've gone through legislative testimony in many states. I can list out the concerns that are raised. And so then what you do is once you get the list of concerns, then you go back and you check to see whether those concerns, at what rate do they occur, if they occur at all. And I guess, and I appreciate it, I'm glad to engage in the academic question. So you're kind of to to the chairman's point, you know, shoot out the OK Corral. Protesters have guns. Everybody has guns. It's a, it's, it's a gun-free, it's the opposite of a gun-free zone. It's, it's a, everyone's potentially armed zone. On an airplane, you're arguing everyone should have weapons, not just the pilots or also the passengers. How far do you take it in terms of gun-free zones? 
Well, I can only take it as far as the data lets me look at it. And where's the had, data take you on that? Well, we don't, at least up after 1963, passengers haven't been allowed to take guns with them on airplanes. Um, but, you know, I kind of need kind of modern data where states change their laws and, you know, not just one national law that's there so I can go and see, begin to disentangle different things. If I only had one experiment, there's often so many different things that can be changing at the same time that it's difficult to disentangle things. So some state may pass a right to carry law at the same time they give more money to police or they increase different criminal penalties. In the United States, since we have all the states now to at least some degree allow concealed carry, there's a lot of states that pass these laws in a lot of different years. And you have enough experiments there to begin to disentangle all the different things that might be changing. But I'll just mention one thing that you may want to go and look at, and that is go look at the points that were raised when Pennsylvania passed its right to carry law. The exact same points that you're raising were raised at that time, the same types of concerns. I think it'd be pretty safe to say that uh, you know, you get out of the state capitol here and go into a restaurant in downtown Harrisburg, you're not worried about a concealed carry permit holder going and creating a problem here. As I say, there's almost 1.3 million concealed carry permit holders in Pennsylvania. The odds that there's somebody in movie theaters next to you or in grocery stores or in restaurants constantly all the time, you know, are extremely high. Right, and, and, and respectfully, I don't know... Right, right, we do have like five other members. If you can finish this question up yeah. and then we'll move on. We can come back to you at the end if we have time. Absolutely. Thank you, Chairman. And I, I don't know if we're conflating two arguments. Are you arguing in favor of concealed carry permit holders in general, that that's a good idea, that they exist, and potentially to have more people concealed carry? Or are you arguing against gun-free zones? Because I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And again, I, I'm not an academic from Swarthmore, um, but I am uh, confused as to the point you're making. I don't see anyone's necessarily making an argument against concealed carry, well, but I think folks are wondering about gun-free zones, and especially, you know, uh, you know, you're, 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 and God bless you if you believe that's where the empirical data gets you. But a lot of us are concerned about introducing guns into colleges, into the capital, into airplanes. Um, so which is it, I guess, is what I'm asking. Is it pro-concealed carry or is it against gun-free zones? Well, if you didn't have concealed carry, then the entire state would be a gun-free zone, in a sense, outside of people's homes. Because every place in public, if you didn't have concealed carry, then it would be illegal for you to carry in places generally. The point is, is that there's, you know, you, you do have concealed carry now. So the vast majority of places you can carry. So the vast majority of places aren't gun-free zones. And the question is, do we logically continue that? We got rid of the vast majority of gun-free zones. Do we go the rest of the way to get rid of some of the remaining gun-free zones? Maybe you might say that there's some you want to keep or not. And that's what I try to look at in terms of the data here. So we're talking about colleges. And the issue there is you raise concerns. I've been a academic most of my life so it's and I've had I have kids in college you know so it's not like the type of thing I take lightly when I go and think about these types of things so you know and the question is you raise concerns about what possibly might go wrong and I don't know any other way of dealing with that other than looking at the experience in those places to see the types of concerns that you raise about what might go wrong whether it's merely a theoretical possibility or it's something that we actually see in practice. Right. And I, and I appreciate that. And again, I don't, I, I, I admit I'm not an expert on arguing the opposite of what seems to be the standard argument. Um, but I guess one of the things is my understanding is Pennsylvania is an open carry state. Right. So there are guns in a lot of places. And again, I don't, I'm not looking for an answer because I know the chairman does want to move on. I think Philadelphia is the only part of our Commonwealth that isn't. So I think there's some arguments that could be made counter to yours, but I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bradford. Representative Dush. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just to touch briefly uh, 
on Chairman Bradford's comments, uh, speaking as somebody who's had extensive law enforcement background experience, I've got to say that when seconds count, the police are minutes away. And when we have our schools that if you have the ability to carry concealed as a, a faculty member of the school, that the chances of stopping something from happening happen in the first seconds. It's not going to happen three to five minutes down the road or whenever the backup finally gets there. Uh, you've actually got somebody, if you've got somebody on site who that the perpetrator does not know is armed, has the ability to take them out, it's a tremendous opportunity. You know, uh, going back, and by the way, speaking of what President, happened here. President Dush, I, if you could have a question for our presenter, we have, we have five other members after you that still, and we have like 15 minutes. If you could just get to the question, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just, if you would please, just elaborate again. The, the facts are the facts, and in real life. Can you go back and elaborate again about uh, the what happened out in Colorado and with the Batman shooting and that, and just explain how these people target their, uh, or choose their targets? Right. Well, uh, in the uh, Holmes's diary, uh, he indicated that his first target was supposed to be an airport, uh, but he had checked it out and had concerns that the security there would kill him before he was able to go and kill the targets that he wanted to go after. He then decided to go af after movie theaters. But we know he cased the different movie theaters that were there. And if you go and look at the different movie theaters, there were seven movie theaters within a 20-minute drive of his apartment. Only one of those movie theaters posted signs banning permit concealed handguns. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, it was true that the police were able to arrive within just a few minutes after the attack there. But as you say, these things are over extremely quickly. Plus, when you're having people running out of the movie theater, it's difficult for the police to be able to go and get in. They often will wait for a couple minutes outside, in any case, to try to gauge what's happening. And uh, look, I mean, you look at surveys of police officers, police officers, well, let me just back up. My research indicates to me police are extremely important. I think police are probably the single most important factor in reducing crime. But as you say, if you also look at surveys of police, they themselves realize that they almost always arrive on the crime scene after the crimes occurred. And the question is, what do you advise people to do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves? And I think that's one of the reasons why, if you again, if you look at surveys of police, they're among the strongest supporters of people being able to go and have guns, both concealed carry and guns for their home, because they realize for themselves the benefit of having guns for protection. And they realize that if they're not there, that's the best option for the civilians to have. But, you know, the problem is when you go and you ban guns from an area, we'd like to believe it makes it safer. But if you, if you only end up having it so that the law-abiding citizens are the ones who are disarmed, not the criminals, you actually create targets because it makes an area where they don't have to worry as much about somebody stopping them. Now, if you only have one police officer or one guard in uniform, then that person is having an incredible risk. I mean, it's an amazingly difficult job for somebody day after day, month after month, year after year to be in uniform guarding a potential target of a mass public shooting. I mean, you look around the world, you have things like the Charlie Hebdo attack. Who was the first person killed there? It was a police officer who was assigned to guard the place. You look at something like the Orlando shooting that occurred last summer. The person that was there was the uh, off-duty police officer who uh, was in uniform. He was the first person shot at by the killer that was there. You look at the Istanbul attack on January 1st. Uh, you know, again, the officer that was there on duty was the first person killed. I can give you many dozens of cases around the world where the first person killed or shot at is the person, is the police or the military person in uniform having to go and guard the place there. And the question is, if that person's killed, what's your backup plan? But I also believe that having somebody there with a concealed carry permit actually makes it safer for that person in uniform because 
the killers them know that they're revealing their location and making it possible that somebody else behind them or to the side might be able to go and take them off out while they're going after the police officer who's putting his life on the line in order to try to make other people safer. Thank you, Representative Dosh. Representative Daly. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, Dr. Lott, I appreciate your being here, and Thank you. Chairman Metcalf, I appreciate your having the hearing. Um, and But I have a lot of documentation here that we received as part of the package for today that debunks a lot of what Dr. Lott is saying. And it seems to me that if we're going to have hearings that are really informational for members of the committee, we would have an opportunity to hear from both sides. And then that way, mm -hmm. I don't have to sit here and read things that debunk what you're saying. We could have um, a more informative kind of opportunity for members of the committee because we deal with a lot of issues and it really is very helpful. So I just have one quick question for you. Um, background checks for all firearms, do you have any viewpoints on those? I have no problem with background checks per se. I think we need to fix a lot of the mess that we have with the current background check system. The In Nixon Pennsylvania or the uh, national system? Well, both. I mean, I know the national system much more in depth, but, uh, you know, about we have about three million people that have been stopped from buying guns because of background checks. But it looks like the false positive rate's about 99% for that. Is that three million across the entire United States? Right. or across the entire, over the entire year and out since how many, out of how many that would have been applied for? Well, you're talking about one and a half percent or so. This is since 1994. So a relatively small percentage of, um, what did you say, false positives? So people well, weren't able to get the gun? All of the people who have been stopped, about 99 percent of those are false positives. But you're talking about people who have been stopped account for about one and a half percent of all the next background checks. All right. But so you don't really have an op any problem with the actual idea of... I have no uh, problem with background checks per se. What I was going to say, though, is that you have to realize it's primarily the most vulnerable people who are being stopped. People tend to have names similar to others in their racial groups. Hispanics have names similar to other Hispanics. Blacks tend to have names on other blacks. Do you have data on this? Yeah, I have data on it. That you could provide to the committee? Sure, I do. And the just to clarify, so 30% of black males are legally prohibited from owning guns because of past criminal history. The way the background checks are done is it unfortunately overstops, makes mistakes on blacks. And the reason is, is that when you fill out the 4473 to buy the gun, you put down your name, your race, your social security number, your address, and your birthday. You think the government's using all that information. All they actually do is use phonetically similar names and birthdays. There's no reason why they should be making those mistakes. They, if All you'd have to do is have the government have to meet the same standards that the government requires when private companies do background checks. If private companies had an error rate that was 100th, the error rate that the federal government has, they'd be su sued out of existence. And, and basically it causes racial discrimination that's there and it's... Uh, unfair. So it seems if you have data that that would be very good data for you to provide to the committee. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Chairman? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Daly. We can agree on something. Representative Bullock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Lott, for being here today. Um, I'm here today actually with a little bit of a somber feeling. This weekend, nine young people were killed just blocks away from my home, all under the age of 25 while attending a block party. My concern in regards to your study and your, your reports is that you talk a lot about these mass shootings, and often I don't think you're thinking about shootings that occur in urban settings and occur doing other um, crimes. I do not know the circumstances in which these young people were shot, whether there were multiple shooters or whether it was cur occurred during the um, occurrence of, uh, of a crime. But my question to you in re regards to your data, since that's what we're discussing today, is do you include mass shootings that occur in the process of a crime? Or are you just thinking or looking at these um, more national types of uh, mass shooters that get ma national attention? I've looked at both. 
but the, you have to understand that the vast majority of the ones that you're talking about are basically drug gang type fights. Well, that's not what we were dealing with, and I never characterized it as that. So I think that it is false to make those kind of assumptions. Okay. Here, here's the point. I look at both, all right? And one reason to go and look at both is that there are different causes that are associated with these types of things. And to go and, uh, and surely the ones that get the most attention are these types of mass public shootings that the FBI has developed this definition for to look at cases where the point is that somebody's going to a school or a business or a mall or a movie theater or someplace like that where the point of the attack isn't to go and commit some other crime like a robbery or fighting over drug turf, but to go and kill people. And so I have brought that up because that's often the one that's focused on in terms of these types of uh, you know laws that we're talking about. But I've looked at the data for public mass shootings generally outside of those that are engaged you know, using the particular FBI definition. But the FBI not only looks at mass public shootings, but it has data on mass shootings too. And, and I've run estimates on that in the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bullock. Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thanks for having this hearing. It indicates to me that uh, you and many others in this room recognize that we have a serious issue of gun violence in our communities. We knew that 33,000 people a year die in America of gun violence, two-thirds of those from suicide, another 80,000 caught in the crossfire. And while I appreciate the anecdotes and the information that Dr. Lott has offered us, Mr. Chairman, my question is for you. Are we going to have a follow-up hearing with an expert who would have an opposite opinion? Thank you, Representative Dean. We appreciate your question. Representative Gobler. He's not going to answer it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Dr. Lott. Thank you so much for Thank you, Chairman. I think it was a question for you. Well, it might have been a question for me, but we're posing questions to our expert testifier, and we have about uh, six minutes left, so I'm happy to talk with Representative Dean at some other time if she wants to recommend somebody to testify. Doesn't mean that I'll accept it, but I'm sure happy to talk to her about it. Well, well, Dr. Lott, thank you so much for uh, sharing the, your data and your evidence with us. Um, I, I guess I wanted to maybe just kind of wrap up the, uh, the hearing with a, a question about um, kind of the overarching theme, which seems to be um, the data suggests that we can try to understand how humans behave. And um, would, would you agree that, um, that human behavior is based upon the rules as they exist. So when we talk about some of these um, hypotheticals, that um, it's it's kind of nonsensical to say that if if you were to change um, if you were to change the way um, that the rules are, but have everybody in a situation that they're in, there's no way to analyze that. Uh, um, well. Look, I mean, I appreciate the hypothetical examples that are given there. Surely we all think about that. It's reasonable things to be concerned about. It's just that once you get the concern, then my solution is to go and look at the data to see the rate that it occurs. If it's something that occurs at a high rate, then it's something that you should put concerns on. If it's something that you can't see occurring at all, then obviously you'd put a lot less weight on it. You know, if we have a lot of data for a lot of states over a lot of years, we have a better understanding or a better way of, of thinking that the numbers that we have would be representative than let's say we only have one state that has a particular rule for us to go and look at examples from that one state. So fortunately, in the types of things that we're talking about today, we have a lot of states that have had these rules in effect, not only kind of in the modern era, but you know before the 1990s also. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to hear from your extensive research from across the country, which um, informs us about how we can do a better job in our own state of approaching rules based on actual data and actual human behavior rather than fear-mongering and scare tactics. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Gobbler. That's all the members' questions we have, sir. Thank well, you so much for joining us today. We appreciate the uh, your expertise and the information you delivered. Thank you very well, much. Thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. Have a great day, sir. Motion to adjourn, Representative Knowles, second by Representative Hill. This means